all know, a couple of, you know, friends and family, the prayer team at church, the pastors, that's good enough. I don't need to keep on talking about this. He says, you need to go out. And, um, but I kept losing potential donors. People would come forward to, to um, get tested, to donate, to, to donate. Oh, you know what? Let me back up. Let me give you some context because I have to, um, not all of you are aware of my situation. Um, so I, three years ago, I was diagnosed with CKD, chronic kidney disease. Uh, and a year into that, I was put on a transplant wait list. And um, then I started dialysis. So CKD is a very misleading disease because I know that I look really normal. I sound normal. You know, if I were to walk down the street and you didn't know me, you wouldn't otherwise know that I was sick. Uh, but my body really is just hanging on, fighting to stay strong. Um, every day I take about, um, right now about nine different medications. It's, it's come down from about 13, but it was, I was just taking a whole lot of pills and I still do every day. I get regular injections every week, one of which I have to give myself. I hate that. Um, and uh, every night through this, I have a catheter right here uh, in this kind of ab area, and that's where I connect myself um, uh, to a dialysis machine. And so for nine, 10 hours every night, it runs removing toxins from my body. Uh, and that's how I stay alive. Um, all the while I wait for a kidney donor. Uh, so, but way back in the beginning, you know, I shared about my news um, with, with these with some people, and God said, keep, keep on going out and sharing your news. And I said, God, I, I don't want to do that, you know? I mean, I know it's not my fault that I have kidney disease, but then to go out and share the need and to solicit a kidney, I mean, to solicit a body part, I thought, God, that's just way out of my comfort zone. And yet, he, he kept nudging me to do that. Um, and it took me losing, I think, about five donors before I got to the point where I just gave in. Okay, all right, God, I'm not gonna fight this anymore. Whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do. And so that's when I started to go out and share and say, you know, this is where I am. This is where I am needy. Uh, and in the process I learned, I saw that God was doing some things and that in, in the process of sharing the need, I was also, I also got to share about my struggle, my ongoing conversation with God. And so that became a blessing not just for other people, but for me as well. So I, I do this as much as to, to bring hope to other people, as much as it helps me. Because when I share these, my story, people come and share their stories of illnesses, of sick children, of, of huge disappointments and how God has come and met them, or not met them, and, and kind of where they have come in their faith and what they have learned in the process. And so that helps me a lot. Uh, so I am always very encouraged by that. But yes, I get to come um, and share. But um, I, I really didn't want to at first. And I realized God was helping me to see, you know, it's not just that you don't like to share about your need. It's that you don't like to be needy. But this yet is at the core of my relationship with you. This is at the core of the gospel message. God sent Jesus to come and save us from our sins. But really, only for those of us acknowledge we, we have a need. Those of us who recognize we can't fix ourselves, we can't earn our way to salvation, we need something or someone outside of ourselves to get us there. Uh, and so Doris, I know you've been a believer, you've been following me for a long time, but this is still, still, you still fight this all the time. You know, you live your life hiding certain parts of your body, the less certain parts of your life, you know, the less than pretty parts of your life. I think we work really hard to hide. And yet God says, no, I am the one who saves you. Don't cheapen my grace. Don't cheapen my sacrifice. You needed salvation, and um, I have this, uh, this huge gift for you. Um, contrast that with Paul in the Bible, who boasts, boasts of his weakness, so that God can be seen, so that God's power can be known to all. And he says, I'm not thinking about me. Look at me. I'm the chief of sinners. I have this thorn on my side. I, I say I want to do things that I don't want to do them, and yet I, I just really struggle with that, and yet God is the one who redeems me. Uh, so in my weakness, God is strong. And so um, for me, that's been, um, the past two years has been all about how God has shown up strong in my weakness. So 
So I realized, yeah, you know, we come from a culture that um, we pride ourselves on being very self-sufficient. Uh, I think for me, being Asian, it's very much ingrained in my culture where I don't like to impose on other people. Uh, and and I actually wrote about that in my blog. I have a I have a blog called Hello Kitty. Uh, so if you ever want to follow my story, it's called Hello Kitty. You just Google that and you'll find me. Um, but in it, I you know I mentioned that. Yeah, I, I don't like to impose on people, so this asking for a kidney is just really, really hard. Um, and somebody came up to me after and said, yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's just your culture that doesn't have to impose on people. I think it's, it's all culture, I think all of us. And I kind of thought, yeah, you're, you're right, and I acknowledge that. And But part of me thought, yeah, but no, you know, for me, I think it's really that much harder, you know? I think it's so ingrained in our culture, like, you know, even when I'm at the restaurant, I don't even like to ask the waitress to take back my hamburger because it's undercooked, you know? Because that's just causing, that's such an inconvenience. Uh, so this is really just that much harder, but, um, uh, so here I am with something way bigger than that, so how am I gonna do this? But yes, God said, go out and share your need. Um, because, you know, I realized it's not just about this. It's, it's about taking on the posture of a child who needs a father, right? That we are just needy people. And, um, and I think when crises enter, crises enter our lives, we're, we're challenged. We're, it tends to magnify all the other issues we've got going on. Uh, so I think when stress is entering, we will be challenged physically, we will be challenged uh, mentally, emotionally, and relationally. Uh, I think that last one is a particularly tough one for me. Um, when we first shared our needs with our pastor, one of uh, our pastor sisters, you know, Martin and Doris, it would be a good idea for you guys to go and get some couples counseling. Uh, and I think she realized that, you know, we were going to enter a period in our lives, a season that was just going to be really rough. Um, and how do we navigate She always pays for our dinner. Uh, sometimes even vacations, she'll cover all that. And so mom is just very generous with her. And um, there was a time when we used to try to pay, you know, especially after we got jobs and grown up. We said, mom, you know, don't pay. You're always pay paying for dinner. It's time for us to pay now, you know. And, um, and we kept pushing that. And one day she just shot back and she said, stop it. You know, I want everybody to just enjoy the meal. We're all here together. You know, and I want you to say, yay, Papa is treating, yay, order anything you want. And I think she was actually getting kind of, it, it made her really happy to be able to provide for us. And I think part of her was 
she was kind of annoyed that he kept trying to push it back on her. Um, and I think God is a lot like that. I think God is just wanting to give to us. He saved us. We have a, I tell my Sunday school kids, my first graders, we have a forever home in heaven, you know, after we die. Uh, but it's more than that. God says, yes, I have all this good stuff, but all that doesn't start when you die and go to heaven. All that starts now. You know, I want to have a relationship with you now. All that wisdom and joy and peace and community, uh, I want to be able to give that to you now. So, so we can live receiving all of that, but that doesn't happen until we just open up about our needs and say, yes, you're right, God. I can't do this by myself. I can't fix myself. And a lot of that's going to happen when we open up to our community. So I think in the process of learning to just lay it out there and say, okay, God, and okay, world, I have this need, and it's not just about my kids' needs. I am a needy person. You know, I don't have it together. I don't have my act together with my marriage, with parenting, with, like, trying to get my life in order. A lot of that, I just really need help. And so I think being in community, um, we, I've learned that God meets us through a lot of that. So letting the community in, fully experiencing God's grace, acknowledge our need. So that's um, one of the big lessons. So the other thing, second big lesson um, I've been learning about is about God's goodness in all circumstances. So um, if you happen to be following my blog, you know that the past two years have been um, a constant string of good news and bad news and good and bad. And at one point I had a donor and then I lost my donor and then I um, had lesions on my kidneys, and then the second ultrasound showed that the lesions got bigger, uh, but then more tests, MRI, and then they said, okay, well, actually, they're harmless, so you're good. And then later on, cysts. Cysts kept showing up on my kidneys, and then they were going, and that it was evident of something called PKD, which is um, a disease where cysts basically grow and grow, and they take over and shut down your kidneys. Um, so I had that, and the other bad news was that it's a genetic disease. So there was a very real possibility that my children had the disease as well. So doctor said, go talk to your pediatrician, uh, look out for these symptoms, get them life insurance. I eventually got a second opinion. Turns out I was misdiagnosed. So I didn't have the genetic form of the disease. So you know they were fine. Uh, I was still, uh, I still had kidney failure, but they were fine, not to worry about them. So it was just like one thing after another good news bad news uh, one thing after the next and then I remember being hit with some bad news one day and I found myself thinking like okay brace yourself here we go again you know just hang in there and anchor yourself in God because I was beginning to see that circumstances sometimes have a way of changing you know sometimes it's good news but it's turns out to be bad, or bad news that turns out to be good, or, you know, things just change, but God was my constant. We can always go to him in prayer. We can always go to the word, and there it says, God is my rock. He is my, he is my life. He is my stronghold. He is my anchor, uh, and I can hang on to them, and, you know, in time, he, I would always have a sense of peace. In time, I would always have enough wisdom and know what next steps to take, that God was always there. And so learning that when things are good, I can celebrate. But I also know things could turn bad any moment. But I also know when things are bad, I can look for ways that God is going to love me through it. And then kind of an odd thought came to me. And I know this is going to sound a little bit um, odd to you, but, um, but hear me out. Why is it that when good things happen, I say, praise God, God is good. And I know all things come, all good things come from above, all blessings we, we need to give that the glory to God uh, and not to take it for granted. Yes, good things come from God. That's why we praise them. But why is it that that's my first reaction? Praise God because this good thing happened. I mean, isn't God just good all the time? I mean, do I equate my good circumstance to a good God? Uh, because what if I had not been misdiagnosed and my children really did have this disease and now you know we're facing kidney disease and possibly full kidney failure? 
what if, you know, what do you tell a, a uh, parent of a sick child who doesn't get well? You know, what if I don't get a transplant and no one ever comes for it? You know, is God then not good? So often we say this great thing happened and God is good, and yet we need to be careful that we don't equate our circumstances with what God is doing and how much he loves us. And so I realize I need to be careful because circumstances never define how much God loves me. Whether my situation is good or bad, it's never an indication of how much, how good he is. Because he is just good all the time. And if he, if God is who he says he is in the Bible, then his care for me is constant. His protection over me doesn't end. And he is inherently good, regardless of what's happening in my situation. And that was important for me to know, because I realized kind of early on in this journey that this couple of years was just going to be full of uncertainties. And it really has turned out to be the case. You know, surprise after one surprise after another. You know, what's the next piece of news that comes along? Is it going to be good news? Is it going to be bad news? Is it going to be bad news turn good? Good turn bad? What is it going to be? Regardless, God is still good in the midst of all that. And so sometimes it's easy for us to think that things are not going our way, or especially we're not going our way, but I see for other people, God met them. God granted them their wish for a family, a house, a job, a child, a partner, whatever it is. What about me? So sometimes it's easy to think, I don't know that God is really good, or I don't know that God is good to me, and that maybe for me he has forgotten me. Where is he in the process? And so I really had to ask those hard questions. God, are you good all the time? Because things just kind of keep on happening. And so I need to hang on to a God that I know is, is never changing and is inherently good, even when I don't see him. So a huge part of that lesson came to me um, when I lost my first donor. So I, so most people think of like a, you know organ donation as finding that one in a gazillion DNA match. You know, some we hear in the news of um, you know go get you know go get tested because um, you know someone has leukemia and so they need to find that you know DNA match. It doesn't quite work that way with kidneys. For kidneys, you basically need someone who's really healthy. And willing. That makes a good candidate, um, you know. And it has to do with you know the anti-rejection medication nowadays has gotten so good that they can get a kidney that isn't the perfect match. It has to be enough of a match, but it doesn't have to be the perfect match. It doesn't have to be your you know sibling um, that they can make it work. But that's hard. How do you find somebody who's willing to sacrifice you know major surgery and um, and and take off a whole month from work? So, but I was very fortunate early on. I had somebody, a family member, who came forward to get donated to me. And so he went through months and months of testing. And uh, so about after three months or so, it was my turn for my workup, which is where they test me to make sure that I'm still strong enough for the surgery that was about to happen. And then it did happen. Uh, some things came up, and my donor decided that he didn't want it. He couldn't do it. And so I will forever be grateful that you know he came forward and went through all that testing. Um, but I was just really shocked because I just felt like I, after all these months, and he seemed so sure, and I know that he really was wanting to go there and wanting to sacrifice for me. Uh, but God, well, you know, so I was just really shocked that at the 11th hour, I lost my second chance at life. Uh, and but the other thing was, I just felt kind of like, God, what are you doing? Because it seemed so clear to me that this was where you had wanted us to be. You know, he had really prayed about his decision. He had rallied a whole network of support um, of people praying for him and for me through this whole process. And he was asking a lot of questions. And all along the way, he just felt just a real strong sense of God's leading. That this is where God wanted him to, to be. Uh, so why would you take us down this road just to take it away at the last minute. And so I, I was just very discouraged. Um, and I came home that week, just a few days after he had shared his decision to, to withdraw. Uh, and there was a note, uh, a card that came in the mail. It was from one of the deaconesses at my church. She said, yeah, don't be discouraged. She said, we are praying for you. God loves you. And 
I thought, huh, I was really kind of like, did God, did, did Marty just tell her about what had just happened? Because it was exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, well, no, you know, he had not shared, we had not shared that with anyone. We hadn't even told the transplant center uh, about this decision. And uh, so this came just at the moment where I just needed to be reminded. And maybe it was God showing up saying, I'm not, I'm still here. I have not forgotten you. I have not abandoned you. So fast forward, um, after that, I was very fortunate to get um, another uh, donor to come to step forward to get tested for me. I call her my angel because she was a friend of a friend. She really didn't even know me that well, but she heard about my situation and said, I'll get tested. I want to I wanna be able to do this for Doris. And so she went through months and months of testing. Uh, and so about four, three, four months in, she was also medically cleared. And, and then it was my turn. And then she, we had set the surgery date and talked to the surgeon. And she said, you know, I've got this work conference. Can we push it off a month? Not a problem. The uh, doctor said it was, it was not going to make a difference. So we went forward with that. And then at the last minute, she withdrew. And again, I was just shocked because at the 11th and a half hour, God, here we are, five months later, and the exact same thing happens again. How could this have happened? And again, I was kind of like wrestling with God because I thought, you know, after what happened with the first donor, we were so much more vigilant about praying through, making sure we were not going to go anywhere unless there was a strong sense of believing and conviction and that this was exactly what you had wanted from us. And so she had, even before uh, she started the whole testing process, she you know, uh, asked input from all the key people in her life to pray for her and like, is this, you know, something that you feel like I should do? And so there was just a real strong sense of affirmation. Yes, yes, you know. And um, so how is it, God, that again, at the last minute, you pull this away from me when I just didn't understand it? And by then, you know, I was also just tired, just physically tired, emotionally because it wasn't just that I kept losing donors, it was the testing, the ultrasound and MRIs and the, uh, the chest x-ray and EKGs and, and the injections and the constant blood draws. You know, I said, God, I am just so tired, tired of being popped by a needle. But the hardest part was the unknown. You know, God, how much longer? When does this end? You know, up until then, I felt like I was running a marathon. It was long, it was tiring, but there, there was a destination. There was a finish line. But now, I have no more donors. I have no more finish lines. So God, now what? Four out of five people on the transplant wait list, they, by the time a kidney becomes available to them, they're either too sick or they die, you know, and, and, uh, and then they can't have the surgery. So God, what is my story going to be? And so I really had a moment of just kind of coming to God weary and just questioning him. Where are you in all this? We've been praying so hard for so long and it seemed like you were speaking but now nothing. So why do we even pray? What is the point? Is this just an exercise you would have us go through but really you're just going to do what you're going to do anyway? Are you even there God or are we all just here on earth, everybody fending for himself. And then, um, and then a voicemail popped up on my phone. It was from someone I um, knew, but really not that well. I see her maybe once a year uh, at, a, at a gathering. And um, she said, Doris, I heard that you have kidney disease. I have no idea what your donor situation is like, but um, I've been thinking about this a long time. I really want to get tested to be a donor for you. And I thought, I was shocked, you know, besides the fact that this was a crazy generous offer from someone who really didn't know me that well, the fact that it came at this point, at this moment, you know, the very week that I had just lost all my options, you know, and, and I was not expecting anybody to come, you know, in all those months leading up until then, nobody had come forward to offer to get tested, and I wasn't expecting it because we had not widely shared the need, you know, up until then, um, and so she came forward and not knowing what my situation was like, 
and you know, I thought, wow, God, is this you showing up again? You know, and I knew by then, circumstances can change, and you know, they often have, and she ultimately withdrew her offer as well, but, but it was enough at the time for me to hear God say, I told you, I told you I would not abandon you, I would not forsake you. I know all this just must seem a little bit crazy, but you are not forgotten. Uh, and I thought, okay, you know, all right, God, I, I think you are a mysterious God. I don't understand how you work. You don't answer our prayers when we ask, but you have never left me. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, and you will not abandon me. And so that much I saw, and maybe, maybe that was all I needed to know. And I found kind of in the process, the more I got to know God and his character, the less I needed to understand and be in control of my situation, my circumstances. And so I think in the silence, in the doubt, in the wrestling with God, I think he was growing my faith. And it kind of, you know, makes sense. Because I think it's in the presence of doubt that faith grows. It's in the presence of, of wrestling with God. I think God doesn't mind us wrestling with him. He just doesn't want us to disengage with him. But to come to him, to ask those hard questions and say, where are you? I don't understand. Why do we pray? I think asking those hard questions sharpens our ability to hear him and to see him because he does come and finally meets us. Um, so I felt like, yes, God, you are with me. And so it was just kind of through these perfectly timed notes and uh, unexpected phone calls and, and people coming to bring me meals that God kept on showing up. You know, people came to, to sit with me through dialysis or offered to come with me through appointments. Uh, people who, you know, the pastor's husband at church and wanted to get a tea. And, and, you know, so as I have shared my needs, people have said, we are praying for you. And so I just felt like as I opened up to my community around me, God was just loving me and lavishing on me and reminding me constantly that he was there for me and with me and was not going to abandon me. And God was meeting me here, too, you know, here in my heart. Marty talked about that peace that we have, that we can choose. God makes that peace available. It's not always, you know, easy to just to say, God give me peace, and it's there. But over time, as you spend more time with him, as you get to know him, know his character, his sovereignty, his far-reaching love, his redemptive power, that you begin to say, okay, okay, I'm going to let this go. God is going to come and meet me. I don't know how, and it's probably not in the way that I expect but God will meet me. So, um, so I just wanted to thank you because I know some of you um, are have been aware of my situation. You guys have been praying for me. People comment on my blog and on Facebook. Um, and so, and I have good news because you guys actually are the first people that I'm publicly sharing that they have just found a kidney match for me. So, um, we're excited about that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I will be updating on my blog tomorrow. I've shared with a couple of people. Um, but it took me, you know, a long time to get here. And it's so not the way I expected. You know, and I realized early on, if God had provided me a kidney with that first donor, I would have missed out on a bigger lesson. So kind of when God doesn't answer, I think sometimes he's got a bigger lesson. He's got more of himself that he wants to show you. Um, and so I feel like I can honestly say to God now, like, okay, you know, I did not expect this from you, but I can see, you know, what you are showing me and what you are teaching me. Um, so I just have been hanging on to Philippians 4, 6, 7, uh, in all things by prayer and petition, um, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A friend of mine um, shared a, an email with me way back um, on a Monday. She said, you know, yesterday at church, my pastor gave this benediction that I have to share with you. He said, as you go, as he was, as he was dismissing us, he said, as you go, may you know, may you remember that we have a God who defends.